Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're watching us from. And welcome to this fireside chat on scaling up access to insulin for people living in low and middle income countries. I am Dr. Mary Wamboy, Engagement Lead at the Access to Medicine Foundation and moderator of this session. It has been more than 100 years since insulin was discovered, which back then and still until today has transformed the management of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Yet, in many of the low and middle income countries, many people who need this insulin do not have access to this essential and life changing product. Moreover, there has been new developments of treatment that is that for diabetes that has shown to be even more effective, for example, the analog insulins or even products that are better storage uh, uh, flexibility and decreases the need of refrigeration. These products are also not available in majority of these countries in low, low and middle income countries. The industry in itself, the pharmaceutical industry do have a role to play in mitigating some of these issues. For more than a decade, the Access to Medicine Foundation has been doing exactly that, tracking the progress made by the essential healthcare com companies to ensure that their products are available and affordable to people who are living in, um, in, in low middle income countries. Today, I am joined by such a beautiful panel. <laughs> Uh, they're specialists within their field, and uh, uh, I think, ladies, uh, welcome to this conversation, and I would like you to do a brief introduction of who we are, of who you are, and we will start with uh, Dr. Eva, and then move to Edith, and then to Claudia. So good day, everybody, and uh, I like, I love my panel, Empowered um, Women. Thank you so much. My name is... Uh, Eva Jenga, I'm a physician and endocrinologist uh, who practices mainly uh, with a uh, lot of diabetic patients. I've been in the practice, um, I don't want to tell you since when, because you just start guessing my age, but for many, many, many decades. And uh, uh, when I met uh, Mary last year, I was really encouraged and excited at uh, the initiative that uh, Access uh, to Medicine Foundation has. And I'm really looking forward to this journey and to see where it will take us. Uh, so um, I practice uh, in Nairobi. I'm still uh, uh, practicing in my clinic. I've also um, uh, been very, very uh, vocal and uh, uh, involved in the NCD Alliance advocacy, having just been a share of the NCD Kenya Alliance. I'm also currently in the Global NCD Alliance Board, so trying to mitigate and uh, to advocate for NCDs, not uh, just in our country regionally, but also uh, looking at the aspect and the, the, the level at which the global community is uh, initiating this. So it's, it's, I'm very happy because being here uh, helps me understand a little bit more what other stakeholders and people with like mind uh, are doing so that uh, the idea is to we struggle uh, we are stronger if we are together and we work together so that we don't have duplication so I'm very happy to be here uh, on this uh, fireside uh, chat my first one uh, I don't know why it's called fireside I really like to, to rate fires from here or <laughs> what it is all about but I'm also happy to meet my neighbor Edith uh, on this forum I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face Claudia too and uh, it, uh, Mary's team. So thank, thank you, you so much for in, uh, inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. We will go now to Edith. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, my, can you hear me? Yes, yes. You go ahead. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Edith Mukantwari. I am a patient advocate from Uganda, um, the co-founder of uh, an organization called Africa Diabetes Alliance. And we try to educate people living with diabetes about how to manage better. I am also a nutritionist by profession and I try to help people living with diabetes understand how to balance managing diabetes with the food intake um, to manage, really up, uh, get to achieve their management goals. And I'm very glad to be here. Um, Mary got in touch with me uh, last year, and it has been wonderful really getting to understand what the Access to Medicine Foundation does. 
it's amazing how much you're doing for people living with diabetes. And I'm really glad to be here as a voice for people living with diabetes. And I'm very grateful to meet Dr. Ivan Jenga as well, because I know there are the other people championing uh, good clinical care for people like me. So it's amazing to see a, a voice of a physician on here as well. So thank you so much for the occasion. I look forward to the discussions. And now to Claudia, uh, we'll give you also this platform. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Claudia Martinez. I am one of the research program managers here at the Access to Medicine Foundation, where, our, where I oversee our program of work on access to diabetes care, specifically looking at what companies are doing to improve access to insulin, to monitoring tools and commodities for people living in low and middle income countries. I am very honored to share this platform with Dr. Eva and Edith today and very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. That's beautiful, beautiful introductions. Um, and I think um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and start this conversation by asking you, Edith, to set the scene. Um, can you please just tell us the challenges, your journey as as from the uh, as a person living with diabetes? Um, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in access to treatment in Uganda, and also from the perspective of the communities that you work with? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mary. So um, one of the challenges I think I faced really from diagnosis, I was diagnosed in 2005 and I was in secondary school, but I was in a boarding school. So not being cl with close family meant that uh, no one really understood what was going on with me specifically. Uh, and the nurses also beat. They also had no idea what was happening. So I kept going for checkups, for medications, but definitely they had no answers. So it took me about two months before I got proper care, uh, before I actually got given permission to go to a hospital and get checked. When I did get checked, I was told I have diabetes, as put on an insulin, um, IV, and... For the first time in months, my symptoms abated. I had no idea what was going on, but all the symptoms were really severe. I had lost so much weight. I was so thirsty all the time. I had literally everything was going wrong. My eyesight had disappeared. So I'd given up on school. I used to spend the days sleeping in the sick bay because I could not see anything on the blackboard. So that meant that I really couldn't go to class anymore. Um, eventually, my mom came to school, picked me up, took me to the hospital. I was diagnosed. And at the time, I was actually given uh, metformin as medication to take to school to swallow twice a day. Of course, that did not work. <laughs> so I went to school with metformin and I was on metformin for three years. So come 2008, it wasn't working. We eventually went to another doctor, Dr. Silva Bahendeka, who actually correctly diagnosed me and put me on insulin. And that was amazing for me because for the first time, I actually was able to manage my symptoms a lot better. Uh, but now when it comes to managing diabetes and, and, and the medications, honestly, we could not afford the medications. They were so expensive. I used to get scared to ask for medication because I come from a big family and resources were always a little tight. So it was, it felt selfish of me to ask for medication when everyone needed food and school fees and books. And so I thought uh, for a long time, actually, I was scared to ask for, for medication. So when I did, it took weeks of talk of getting up the courage talking myself into actually asking for what i needed and when i did sometimes i had to understand when there was no money you know i had to understand and and it wasn't easy to be honest it was really complicated but i i knew you know what if you want to survive you're going to have to figure this out on your own so i tried to take matters into my own hands of course being a child there was very little that i could do so throughout campus university um it was still a huge challenge, but fortunately, around my third year, I was introduced to the Changing Diabetes in Children program, mm -hmm. and for, for the first time in years, I actually had, like, a huge weight was lifted from feeling, like, so anxious every time my insulin was running out, and now, knowing that I can just walk to the clinic and get free medication, a huge weight was lifted, a huge weight. So I did not, I actually had no idea how huge a weight I was carrying until I had that option. And 
honestly, I feel like a lot had been eased in my life. So the CDIC program was very instrumental for me. It helped me manage to get better at school. I had given up on attending class, even through university. I think in first year, I would only go to take tests and exams. That's it. And I was fortunate. I had great classmates who would come to my dormitory or to my hostel, and they would actually discuss for me what was taught. So I was very grateful for that. But I missed out on so many opportunities because of it. And I see so many children now and young adults missing out on opportunities because they cannot afford to get the care that they need. Yeah, so I think really this conversation is very pertinent at the moment. So many lives can be changed uh, when pharma gets into uh, being able to uh, address some of these challenges. Yeah, thank you. So from the communities that you're working with, how have you seen the pharma addressing some of these key challenges of, of access to treatment in your country? Um, so is that for me still? Yeah. How have oh, you okay. seen um, so <laughs> Yeah, so um, I've seen pharma has actually is the, is the is pharma companies are the ones behind the Changing Diabetes in Children program. Yeah. And because pharma is behind that, we've been able to get free insulin, free syringes, free uh, glucometers, free strips. Mm -hmm. so we're able to get glucose. Um, we've seen that they, they're able to provide education resources that have been familiar with uh, through some of the clinics as well. Um, they've also trained uh, healthcare workers, even nurses who tend to care for, for, for patients in rural areas. So we find that uh, pharma has really gone ahead to do a lot to really make it easy to get access to the care that a lot of people need. Um, beyond that, they pay for a lot of conferences. They sponsor a lot of uh, training sessions for health workers. They go really above and beyond to make sure that the, the healthcare workers are equipped with the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to care for patients better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think now that moves into the next step where I'll be asking Dr. Eva, you're a clinician. And like you mentioned, you have decades of experience of treating uh, patients with diabetes in, in Kenya. Um, wh wh what has been the evolution like for treatment of, 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 of patients with of people living with diabetes in Kenya? And how also have you seen some of the examples where you've seen the, uh, the, the, the industry coming in and addressing some of these key challenges? Well, thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you, Edith. You've outlined exactly what the views and vo uh, voices of a person living with diabetes very, very clearly, and it resonates exactly with the, my experience as a physician and a diabetologist. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, uh, Mary, well, before, I can say I started when we used to have the insulin mainly in, uh, I'll, I'll talk mainly uh, for type 1 diabetics, uh, when Kenya, uh, we start, I start, became a diabetologist, I was a physician, and imagine I was taking care of both type 1 and type 2s, because we didn't have pediatric endocrinologists at that point. Mm -hmm. So it was really tough. Uh, I, I, I had churned pediatrics uh, in, in my postgrad because I was too emotional, a woman, to deal with a child who is suffering. So I didn't want to see a child crying or a child sick. I always had these questions for God. Why? Why a little child? There are many adults who are, who are bad people. Why don't you give them this condition and leave the children not to suffer? So I had left pediatrics, which was actually one of my best uh, subjects uh, as an undergrad, and taken uh, uh, internal medicine. So we had, in the, I, used, I worked initially in a public hospital and then in a teaching hospital we had the insulin that came in, in bottles, in vials. So then the sedages, we used to have the ones that used to be boiled for sterilization. I'm sure most of you have no clue with this. I don't think you've ever been to a place no. whereby they, you had to get like one or two sedages and for sterilizing, you had to boil and boil them and then wipe the needles which you had to reuse uh, with spirits. I can tell you it was really, really painful uh, measuring insulin in some of those syringes. I have one of my, my colleagues who is a diabetologist uh, who was 
my patient when he was a, a medical student and he keeps he has kept some of those gadgets that he had those many years and he every time we go to a conference he shows people the journey we have come and most people just open their mouth because they can't understand how mm-hmm. somebody ever used to inject themselves with such needles and uh, boiling them and huge and very thick Mm-hmm. So most of the kids sometimes would get uh, infections at the site of injections and swellings. It was an inflammation, so it was very painful. And then, of course, the clinics that we used to run then, diabetes, even then in the early 80s, was still quite common in most of our uh, outpatient clinics. So we would have, uh, uh, like the, the teaching hospital, the National Teaching Hospital, where I, I ran the diabetes clinic, we would have so many patients on the once a week diabetes clinic. Mm. So you can imagine you see a patient and because you are very few physicians uh, or even the, the medical officers, you are seeing the patients very fast. So getting the history and even hearing what he did saying how she took uh, two months for diagnosis, it's, it really is true. And those are the challenges that that made some of us become uh, go and, and uh, do diabetology, become diabetes educators in the process, and even setting up a, a charity organization that will help and support patients. And that's how I became a founder of Diabetes Management and Information Center in Kenya. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, we, it was kind of a progress and growth, whereby after getting those needles uh, that were big, then we became to disposable syringes. Of course, that was much better. The needles were still big, so it was quite difficult. That now, at that point, there's nobody who owned a glucometer. So we would take blood and send it to the lab. And this, the process of doing a blood glucose in the lab is not the way it is now that in five seconds you get your, your, your sugar level. It would sometimes take a day. Oh. When I was an intern, wow. uh, when you take blood and take it to the lab, it's only the following morning you'd know how high the sugar was for your patient last night. Imagine, of course, the boat has sailed as to how you'd have impacted the, the treatment at that point. So that, you know, you know, some of these things, that what we see now, we take a lot for granted. So, But we have evolved a lot with the education and training. And of course, now the pharma also coming with new uh, uh, types of insulins, new modes of injections. And of course, even now when it came to pens, of course, then that uh, it was revolutionary. It changed life of patients. Of course, then you, especially for children, to try and show them even having different sizes of needles so that they have needles that don't cause pain when you uh, give them the subcutaneous injections. Because of course, everybody, even adults are so scared of injections. So usually when we t- start with educating the patient, we try to show them how painless it is now at this point in time. But those days, of course, I couldn't use those big syringes and needles to inject myself. Now I've easily will use a pen to inject myself to show, to prove to the patient it's pain-free. And of course it's easy. And teaching them even the fact that some pens with a creak, they don't even have to look, they can count. So in case you have, poor vision like it, it has a diagnosis, you don't have to worry about using the wrong dose. So you listen to the click and one click is one unit and we educate patients. Let me tell you, these are things that I can, you know, the, the joy you see in patients and when they tell you, oh, Dr. is not, oh, Dr. is a Swahili word for doctor. It's not painful. And they become, you know, they, they are so overjoyed that it's not going to cause so much pain. But the thing is, um, how coming with all this new development, it's been the cost. Mm. Of course, and especially now it's uh, in uh, uh, government institutions, when you, you talk about the National Health Insurance Funds, most patients, most insurances, even the national one, for the longest time could not insure people with diabetes. Of course, it's called it's a chronic illness. Uh, then especially some the, the, the private insurances is pre-existing condition. So it is one of the excluded conditions it used to be until again, some of us fought and tried to educate the insurances that if you manage these patients well by giving them the right medication, by diagnosing them early, by helping them monitor their sugars, the cost of managing that patient uh, would, uh, becomes less because they don't get the complications that eventually will cost a lot. Some of the, the insurances will not pay for a patient going to see 
a, a doctor or a health professional as an outpatient. But when they go into hospital, then they pay. Then you, you realize most of the patients, by the time a patient is going to hospital, a diabetic patient go to hospital, it's because of a complication, because you really don't need to admit diabetic patients. When they are managed well, they can manage, and you empower them, they manage themselves so well, they will only either send you the reports or they, they will, they, they will uh, come for review uh, on a regular basis without ever having to be admitted. But when the insurances wait until a patient is admitted, either they have the diabetic ketoacidosis doses or in the hypoglycemia, or they have already have neuropathy, or they have a wood that needs even amputation, or they're already in kidney dialysis, uh, going uh, renal dialysis, then they pay, but they pay so much. If they had invested that amount of money early enough at the diagnosis of this patient to empower them with education, engage the team uh, care that we usually uh, advocate for, a nutritionist, a diabetes educator, send them to the eye doctor at the, uh, the uh, a regular basis, do their annual checks early so that you detect even the earliest proteinuria to make sure that you manage it before they go to further complications. So the, that involvement in the man, uh, management is what that uh, we are we are seeing, and it has really helped. So okay. I think we have come a long way. And then let me mm -hmm. tell you what the farmer has done. Mm. Uh, the CDIC project, uh, what uh, it is, has alluded to, is something that has come to liberate the what the outcome of type one diabetes in the East, in the East African region. We have DMI was actually one of the the the, the the centers that started with the CDIC project. And that was Novo Nordisk that came in. And then of course they, they came in with Roche because of diagnostics. And we've had support even moving forward people, with people like Sanofi. And of course LID, they also did help some because CDIC is limited to children or to type one less than 18 years. So when they become adults and they exit that program, where do they go? They still are not earning, they cannot afford to buy their own insulin, they can't afford to buy their own strips. So we try and uh, mobilize and partner with also the other farmers. So I must say, like Edith has said, I give a plus to the farmer. This far they have come and they have really saved lives. The quality of life for type one diabetics have changed because also the way the farm has also engaged, not just because they want sales, they've also engaged in capacity building. And Edith has alluded to that and I can say for sure, I agree with her 100% because yep. we, even we had the changing diabetes uh, uh, in, uh, in our professionals and empowering our, uh, our uh, not only the doctors, but nurses to, for diabetes education, nutritionists going for diabetes education and all the other people that food care. We've seen many sessions and workshops and this has really improved a lot. So we welcome any of the other partners who come in to make it life, easy, uh, life easier and improve the quality of life. Empowering patients has been my passion. Because once you empower, usually my, when I admit patients in hospital, even nurses say, if that is Dr. Eva Jagger's patient, be careful because they know more than you do. Because they, the patient will ask questions. If you don't examine their feet, they will ask you why you haven't examined their feet. If you are late to give them the insulin before the meal, they will call you out. So I like it. And I tell the patient, it is your life, take control. And the way I like it, they say she took control. That's exactly what I tell my patients. <laughs> and I'm very proud of you, Edith. So I can't, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm so excited about this. Thank you. Wow, that, that is a summary of, of, of <laughs> the evolution of treatment all the way in Kenya and seeing also the industry coming in and trying to mitigate some of this issue. Now, Claudia, mm -hmm. I want to jump to you and um, because um, the Access to Medicine Foundation last year published actually an, uh, a report on uh, what exactly the, the, pharma, the pharma industry are doing to ensure that insulin is accessible to people in LMICs. So, Claudia, would you be able to, to highlight some of these uh, key findings and also listening to some of these challenges that we are hearing from, from Dr. Eva, from Edith? Uh, so, examples of how you've incorporated say, some of these into, the, in, into our research. 
Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marianne. I mean, I think uh, both Edith and Dr. Eva have done a great job at setting out some of the great progress that we've seen, which is to be acknowledged. And then that sort of it comes out loud and clear. But I think we also need to recognize that there are still quite a few gaps when it comes to people being able to access treatment, mm -hmm. monitoring, and actually having that continuity of care that makes it possible to be able to uh, yeah, to, to live a healthy life in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, and something that has come loud and clear, I think, from this conversation and, and our research as well, is that this is truly a, a multi-party approach, mm -hmm. right? It's not only for companies to solve. We really mm -hmm. require a lot of actors to come on board to be able to find mm -hmm. the better solutions. And But I think at the same time, we also need to be mindful that companies play a huge role, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the companies that are manufacturing and supplying insulin, they do play an increasing role in ensuring access in some of the countries where we see the largest gaps, especially when we're looking at a market that is so heavily concentrated, such as the mm -hmm. insulin market. And I think that was the starting point for our research, really looking at what are companies doing to really expand access to insulin and their products in the 108 countries that we at the Access to Medicine Foundation identify as the ones uh, where we do see the largest access gaps, both in availability and affordability of these products. So for this uh, research, uh, we looked at four of the companies. I think one of, most of the initiatives have been mentioned already. Uh, so the companies uh, are Eli Lili, Novo Nordisk, Sanofi. We also looked at Biocon, which is one of the leading insulin mm -hmm. manufacturers for biosimilar insulins. Uh, mm -hmm. Also something that has a lot of potential to increase affordability for patients. And we, we asked ourselves two questions. First, what are these companies doing and what are the main strategies that they're implementing to expand access, mm -hmm. whether this is the pediatric programs that we've heard about, donations or pricing strategies? And secondly, we also looked at product registrations. So understanding that this is the first step for actually making some of these products available in a country, we really wanted to understand how widely these companies are filing for registration in some of the LMICs, low and middle income countries uh, within our scope. It is a very detailed report, uh, but if I have to summarize the findings, I would go to two areas. First, we do see that the companies, they are indeed pursuing a variety of strategies. This mm. includes uh, some of the longstanding pediatric programs. Uh, we have the Lili List Life for a Child program, the CDAC program implemented by Novo Nordisk. We do see donation programs. As Dr. Eva was saying, we do see companies actually investing more in capacity building and educational initiatives. So it's not only about providing the product, but actually going a step further. Uh, and we also see companies trying to work a bit more collaboratively with ministries of health and also with the local governments to actually embed some of these programs into the systems. But the main problem that we see is that most of the initiatives are still fairly concentrated in a few countries. And also in some populations, right? I mean, we do see a lot of focus on children uh, and we do see sometimes a problem of sort of people graduating out of these pediatric programs and the types of support that they would need uh, for them to continue accessing treatment. And, and, and this is one of the areas where we do see a lot of opportunity for companies to work a bit more with governments and ministries of health to find better solutions. A second very important thing that we found is, and Dr. Eva talked about the cost. I think, Edith, you also talked quite a bit about how many of these treatments are not really affordable. This is a problem for, for many, many people who are living with diabetes. And we do see that companies are implementing strategies to address the pricing issue. But in many cases, this is still focused mostly on the human insulins. Uh, and this comes back to what you, Mary, were saying a bit earlier about these newer analogs and other types of insulins that could still yield benefits for patients. Uh, but we do see that many of the strategies are still very much focused on, on the human insulins. Um, and the companies already have some pricing strategies uh, on the human insulin side. Novo Nordis has, for example, the access to insulin commitment where they are, provi they are providing um, insulin vials uh, for $3, three US dollars per vial to governments in 76 low and middle income countries. Biocon has already started uh, a program with the Mission 10 Cents Initiative, which is being deployed in, in different countries uh, already in the Philippines. Um, 
we also see some companies like Sanofi, for example, making some efforts on analogs. So they have had specific pricing strategies for analogs uh, in some parts of Nigeria, some specific states in Nigeria, also in Kenya. And also Sanofi, particularly, they already have a wider commitment through their new global access unit uh, to cover more low and middle income countries uh, with treatment and also specific access strategies for analogs. So a lot more needs to be done to be able to develop better pricing strategies, both for human insulins, because we know that many people can still not afford the human insulin. So that's something to highlight, but also for these newer and comparatively higher priced analogs. And the final point uh, that I want to bring in, um, and I would love to hear reactions from, from Dr. Eva and Edith as well, is um, on registration. And I think this is a very striking finding from our side. We do find that in many low and middle income countries, but especially in those countries where you have the poorest populations and the smaller markets, that's where companies are not necessarily reaching uh, in with their products. We did find that less than 30% of the countries that we looked at had all of the insulins that the WHO considers to be essential registered. And what is worse is that in 24 countries, uh, none of the insulins that these companies are manufacturing are available. So this leaves a big gap, right? And this is for human insulins. We do see something, a very similar picture with analogs where we do see a lot of registrations in high income countries and upper middle income countries, but in many countries, especially the lower, the low income countries, some do not even have a single analog, analog insulin registered. So there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of scope uh, to really capitalize on some of the work that is already happening, but, but actually to expand it uh, to reach more people in more countries uh, with these products. Wow, thank you, Claudia, for uh, summarizing this. And, and Claudia, I just want to follow up on this a little bit. And, and yes, at the foundation, we do carry this amazing research that is trying to move the industry. But how actually do you move the industry with this data? Ah, that's an excellent question. I, I, I think for us, the value of tracking progress and tracking activities is, is what really sets the scene in terms of understanding where the gaps are and really exposing those gaps and really pointing companies towards those opportunities as well. So that's something that we, we use our research for to really identify opportunities and gaps and also opportunities specifically for each of the companies. There's also a lot of value from learning from what other companies are doing. I think something that we have discussed today is that there are a lot of different models being implemented in different countries with different partnership models as well. So in that sense, uh, being able to learn from those experiences and what works, what doesn't work is something that uh, we also see as a, a really important avenue uh, for really thinking maybe outside the box um, and really implementing new models for, for access. Wow, thank you. Um, I've, I've, I think we've heard a lot of the, in this conversation on what the industry is, is doing, and it seems they are doing uh, a lot of things uh, when you're looking at uh, some of these initiatives that we have had. Um, and also we've heard from Claudia about the gaps. I think for us as, as this, this, this session, I would love to hear from all of you. If we look at uh, what the, in the industry are doing, is it enough? I would imagine not. But then how can we be able to move the industry to do more? If you are told right now to come up with a call for action for the industry, uh, what would be the key three, four points that you would say, this is how I see the industry should be even doing more in my country? I think I'll just then hop off to Dr. Eva. I have oh, a very perfect. short call on action. Uh, what would you say would be the key point that we we'll want for the industry to um, to 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 move? What to do? So th thank you, Mary, and thank you, Claudia, for summarizing what Access uh, to Medicine Foundation is doing. And I applaud, I applaud you for the research because one of the things I would really, really want the industry to get themselves involved in is research and collecting the data. Mm -hmm. Collecting the data in the in the this low and middle income countries because most of the data that you have even in the IDF atlas you look at is from developed countries and whatever it is they, they write about uh, Africa and Asia some some of them is just projections and get, uh, I wouldn't say it's guesswork but I think 
it's very, very little research is done in the low and middle income uh, 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 countries. And you know, research data is so powerful. That is what helps drive policy. So if I want to go and, uh, and advocate to my policymakers, the people, even the national insurance fund, I need data to show them that we have so many type one diabetics with the access to insulin or even to, uh, to analog insulin or to, is important because of uh, the quality of life that you get. And we can we need that data to show a difference between children who've been well controlled on insulin, children who have uh, benefited from the CDIC project, and then we get children who have had no access what are, how many school days have they lost? How many, what is the, the, the impact on their growth, even their performance in school? And what is, what are the other areas, the gaps that those children who have not been, who are not in the CDIC pro, pro, project. So I would urge the industry, get, uh, let's all get together. If, if such I know is expensive and even coming manufacturing these products are expensive. So even in the CDIC project, we always tell the kids, that this is not, yes, you are getting free insulin, but it is not free. Somebody has paid for it. Mm -hmm. Whether it is the, the farmer, whether the government has uh, 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 paid some amount of money, even in some of the, 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 uh, the public hospitals, the government buys from the farmer at the $3 and makes sure it gets to the, the patient at that amount. So that discounted rate is paid by somebody. So we try and make the patients understand it's not free even getting those free uh, glucose strips, somebody has paid for them. So we need this data that, and oh, I, that's why I'm so happy with what uh, Claudia and your team and Mary to have this data that can pub be published. But can we have that more of that data in the low and middle income countries? So that then it will show, you've said there are people, countries that don't have uh, uh, analog. I'm, I'm glad to say that in Af East Africa region, we have both human and the analog insulin, but again, how, how many patients, the only, even the kids on the access uh, on the CDIC project can only get the human insulin. They can't afford, and we, uh, the, the, the industry can't afford to put them on analog. So you can see there's still that selective uh, uh, type of what do you give even to the CDIC pro project children. There are very few, that, so the only key people who can afford analog are the people who can actually pay for it out of pocket. So we need that data. So to me, the industry should come out and join us and do research, help us do research. Thank you so, so much. Edith, it's on you also, very quick call of action. <laughs> uh, my call to action would be, um, number one, the fact that a lot of patients don't know about these programs. A, num a huge number of them don't know about these programs. And one of the easiest ways to get information out there is by actually asking patients to talk about these things, talk about these programs, actually tell other people within their communities. We actually realize in our work that patients have more reach than healthcare workers do. Mm -hmm. Patients are more in the community than, than healthcare workers are. So having patients, empowering patients, and also actually giving them uh, facilitation to be able to spread this information into their communities makes a lot of difference in getting the word out there. Um, the other thing I would say uh, as a call to action is we're try right now we're trying to advocate for universal health coverage in so many low to middle income countries and it's really important. But what we're realizing is even the UHC is focused mostly on communicable diseases. These uh, conversations about adding medications for non-communicable diseases are also being included now, but it's still not yet really on the ground. So as part of UHC uh, advocacy, it's important to actually really advocate for medications for diabetes and other non-communicable diseases. Um, that's another call to action. The other one is uh, what uh, Claudia spoke about, how when patients are being, are getting out of these programs because there are edge limits to this. And they, a lot of, when I, I think when I finished university, I had to leave the CDIC program but I didn't have a fallback. I was still trying to find a, a source of income, uh, some, um, some way to get to make a living. It was not easy at all, but I had to go back to zero. So I fell sick again. 
Um, so not having that continuity is another really big problem. Being able to get that continuity is important. What Dr. Eva also spoke about, um, she said something about patients uh, being able to understand what it's losing from not being part of the programs. What's the difference between a patient who's on the CDIC program and a patient that's not? We're realizing that a lot of patients are not actually getting access to these programs like you're talking about. And that makes them, unfortunately, gives them a poorer chance of survival, a poorer chance of being able to achieve um, their, their, their goals in, in life generally. So you find that because you've had a big challenge like this, for example, I lost I lost a lot of time uh, and, and ended up failing. In my opinion, I failed <laughs> because I didn't have the health to actually really push myself to achieve what I wanted to achieve. At, at, at some point, I was at, at the best in class and I feel, I feel like I, I could not keep that up because I, I didn't have access to everything that I needed. And a lot of patients are losing out in terms of productivity, in terms of access to even trying to really be the people they're trying to be. It's difficult when you're trying to also um, survive from one day to the next. So I think those would be my calls to action. Really take those into account and ask pharma to actually come strong and include patients. Also important to train the patients. It's important to empower the patients because ultimately they're the ones who are living with the disease for the majority of the time. 90% of the time we're living with this disease up and we see our doctors 10% of the time. So that 90% of the time we find patients don't have the skills they require to actually really do what the clinicians are advising. So it's important to really take this into account. Thank you. Okay. As we go to the close, uh, give us a call to action and then uh, we can come to an end. Yeah, thank you, Marianne. It's been fascinating hearing from, from both Edith and, and Dr. Eva on, on some of these challenges and some of the solutions as well. I truly think that we are at a point where there's a golden opportunity for companies to really build on some of the successes that they've had with some mm. of these programs and really expanding those out and scaling up those programs to reach more people in more countries with more products. So there's, I guess, this huge opportunity to really expand that further. I think to do so, we really need, need to take into account what Dr. Eva was saying. We do need to look at the specific context of the different countries when talking about data, when talking about what is the reality of those countries and how can companies actually develop specific models for these countries, mm -hmm. for low and middle income countries, considering that low and middle income countries are actually quite uh, heterogeneous and, and different, right? I think a second point that I think is extremely important is we need to acknowledge that cost continues to be, mm. uh, cons continues to impact access for people. So I think many, many people are still paying out of pocket for their mm. treatments in low and middle income countries. Pricing remains an issue. So we do want to see more action from companies to address um, mm. access both for patients paying in the private market, in the public market, uh, but also for more products. And I would say that the final thing is, I think there's a lot to be gained from, we, we do observe that the best models, the models where we see more success and traction are exactly those that go beyond just pricing affordability, but they really build in some of the components that Dr. Eva and Edith have been talking about today. Thinking about capacity building, thinking about education and thinking ultimately about the person who is at the receiving end of mm. these programs. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a very informative session, and I think we've highlighted some of the key challenges. And I, I think I will lead you back to what Claudia said, uh, that this is, um, it's, uh, it's such a complex issue that need multi-stakeholders to come mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. and address some of these key issues. We have heard that the farmer can come in and work with the patient groups or patient organization or be it, uh, uh, partnering with governments to actually figure out how to bridge some of these gas, uh, gaps. Or we talk about the, the, the thinking about the prices. How can this uh, um, uh, insulin be affordable to people who are living in LMICs? Registration um, and the essence of data that we need 
credible data that can showcase these gaps so that we can be able to push the industry and all the other very important stakeholders to come together and address some of these gaps. And with that, ladies, I really, really wanted to say a huge thank you uh, for joining the, 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 this panel. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the next time we will meet. And um, I think uh, that's the end for, the, for this session. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye, wow. Mary.